So this is a revision video about Tennyson's The Charge of the Light Brigade and I'm going to look at it in terms of its structure, point of view, imagery and main themes in the usual way. First there's some thoughts about its historical context because you need to understand that to fully understand the poem. So The Charge of the Light Brigade tells the story of a disastrous military engagement that took place at the start of the Crimean War between Turkey and Russia. Under the command of Lord Raglan, if you remember he's mentioned in Belfast Confetti, there's a street named after him in Belfast. Under his disastrous command, British forces entered the war in September 1854 to prevent the Russians from obtaining control of the important sea routes through the Dardanelles. So in October of 1854, the Russians were seizing guns from British soldiers and Lord Raglan sent desperate orders to his light cavalry to fend off the Russians. Finally, one of his orders was acted upon and the brigade began charging, but in the wrong direction. Over 650 men rushed forward then, and within just the first few minutes, over 100 of them were already dead. As a result of the battle, Britain lost possession of most of its forward defences. Looking back from the 21st century, we tend to dismiss the Crimean War as an example of military incompetence. And when we think about it, it tends to be much more in relation to the heroism of Florence Nightingale than that of um, our military forces. But for Tennyson and his contemporaries, the war seemed necessary and just. He was writing at the time that these events took place. And we're going to listen to the poem now, and I hope that you hear in that a tone of celebration. He saw these soldiers as heroic and courageous, following commands even to their deaths. And so The Charge of the Light Brigade is a poem which very much glorifies war, regardless, as in this case, of all the sheer incompetence and waste. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the Light Brigade, Charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade. Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply. Theirs not to reason why. Theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to the right of them. Cannon to the left of them. Cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the six hundred. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the sabre stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the six hundred. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon behind them volleyed and thundered. Stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell, they that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them, left of six hundred. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. All the world wondered. Honour the charge they made. Honour the Light Brigade. Noble 600. So thinking first of all about structure, one of the really striking things about this poem is its very strong rhythm, almost a military rhythm you could say, or a rhythm evoking a pounding horse. So it's a dum da da dum da da all the way through, a stressed syllable followed by two unstressed or less stressed syllables. Now when a stressed syllable is followed by two unstressed syllables. In other words, when we have dum dudder, that's described as dactyl. You've got the spelling there on the slide. And when we have two dactyl feet per line, 
in other words, two stressed syllables per line, then that's called dimeter. So this poem is written in dactyl dimeter, otherwise known as dum dudder. It's key to its driving energy, its tone, so don't fail to mention that in the exam. Tennyson also makes use of rhyme for effects in this poem, but the rhyme scheme certainly isn't regular, so it's probably best to look at his use of rhyme when we scrutinise each stanza a little bit more closely. The stanzas are different lengths too, so again, no fixed form that Tennyson's following here. Again, as we'll see in a minute or two, he uses a lot of repetition, uh, a sort of patterning that holds the poem together. And there's also a refrain that ends the first three stanzas, a reference to the 600 men, reminding us of what's at stake. The narrative structure is very simple. Um, Tennyson doesn't bother with background detail about the Crimean War or the reasons for this engagement or anything like that. We start straight in the middle of the action. We're there in the battle with these men and each stanza progresses the development of the attack. This is a third person poem. It's not written in the, in the first person. However, when you hear it, it does seem like the speaker was there. That is the effect that Tennyson seems to be trying to achieve. It's as if the, the narrator in the poem is remembering the charge. He wants to pass on that story of heroes who died on the day. And you can hear the power of his memories and his patriotism behind every word in this poem. He sees the tragedy of war, but he sees the positive side as well, the things it brings out in the men. And he wants us, he wants readers to see this too. He wants to stir us up to make sure we don't forget the sacrifice that day. It's almost at times as if he gets a little bit carried away. It seems a bit sentimental. But it's impossible not to be moved by the speaker and to respect his passion. His celebration of courage in the face of impossible adversity. So the poem begins with a phrase repeated three times, half a league, half a league, and you can hear that pulsating rhythm that I mentioned earlier that's so fundamental to the meaning of this poem. What's that mean though, half a league? Well, a league was an old way of measuring distance, and it was equal to about three miles. So half a league is roughly a mile and a half. What's conveyed here is a sense of the narrator urging himself on, half a league, half a league, just half a league to go. Um, we get a sense of exhaustion and pushing yourself beyond that point, which is important later in the poem, as we'll see. The reference to the valley of death evokes a terrifying place, and the reader realises that that's what these riders are in. There are 600 of them. And then we get military orders shouted into the poem, adding to its sense of drama, especially as the men are being ordered to charge for the guns, not a direction most of us would want to go in. So why such an order, we wonder? Why charge towards the valley of death? In another example of repetition, and I said that that's a key feature of this poem, the order is repeated. Forward, the light brigade. So the speaker really wants us to focus on those words, on the command to move forward. And we already know that they're moving forward towards their doom, towards the valley of death. The next line, a question, invites us to think about what might be going on inside the soldiers' heads. Was there a man dismayed? In other words, was there a man who began to question this mission or lose his courage? The word not at the start of the next line seems to answer the question. These men are ready to do their job. There's not to make reply. There's not to reason why. These are crucially important lines because they show that these soldiers aren't dumb. They know this charge isn't a good idea, that someone's made a mistake, someone's blundered. But theirs is to do and die. The rhyme there holds those three lines together and it creates a sense of the humble heroism of these men. They're not going to worry about the politics, the order. They know that their vocation is to follow orders, even if it leads them into the valley of death. And the stanza concludes with that refrain, into the valley of death, 
rode the 600. And that refrain emphasises the main action of the poem, which is that these men are riding to their death. It also gives a smooth, dignified rhythm to the poem, this refrain. The repetition of the word canon at the start of each line here creates a real intensity. It's as if we are with the light brigade surrounded with cannons in front, left, right. We're turning our heads, looking for the cannon with the riders. A volley is a round of cannon fire. So these cannons are firing at the men and we have here a sense of the immense sound. Thundered is the word that evokes that and stormed as well with shot and shell, so they're also being fired at from rifles. But despite, despite this, they ride boldly and well. Again, highlighting the heroism of the men, their composure, despite this hellish world that they've found themselves in. And that idea of hellishness is obviously reinforced by the idea of being in the jaws of death. So death is represented as a ferocious, beast which is about to consume them, but still they ride on the 600. Now bear in mind that these soldiers weren't carrying machine guns, they were riding through this storm of bullets and cannon fire on horses carrying swords and the horror of that idea is conveyed in this stanza. So think about that, you're charging on horseback with a sword towards an enemy with guns and cannon the image of flashing swords at the start of the stanza evokes medieval knights fighting and this central theme of desperate heroism is again reinforced. But it turns out the Light Brigade has some luck. They reach the guns and stab the men who are operating them. Sabring the gunners there is a very vivid image. But then the scale of what they're up against is reinforced again with the phrase charging an army. And the speaker imagines that all the world wondered at this charge. That line suggests that we should be amazed by what this light cavalry did. The brave men ride on through the smoke that's coming from the battery, which is a group of cannon, and they even break through the line. That's a major moment in a battle at this time. Um, back in those days, soldiers would line up on a field and shoot or run or ride at each other. So for an attack, a charge like this to succeed, the soldiers need to get through the enemy line in order to do damage. In the second half of this stanza, we get the first reference to the enemy, to the Cossack and Russian. The Cossacks were famously fierce soldiers allied with the Russian Empire. So that adds to the enormity of this heroism that we're seeing. Moreover, this enemy is shattered and sundered. Very powerful verbs throughout this poem, and notice their positioning at the start of so many lines. That adds to their impact, charging, plunged, flashed, sabring, for example. Sundered, by the way, means broken into two. At the end of this stanza is a key moment, because the main action so far the charge has gone as, if, as far as it can. Now the soldiers have to turn back where they came from. Not all of them though, some have died. And the simple phrase, not the 600, is our first hint of the terrible casualties the Light Brigade has suffered. The words are also emphasised because the refrain that we're now familiar with is different, it's changed. So the short, simple line at the end of this stanza has great impact and the poem becomes, from this point, more mournful. So these lines are almost an exact repeat of the beginning of the third stanza. The only change is in line 41, because the cannon that were in front of them are now behind them, which means that the Light Brigade has turned around and is leaving the enemy behind. The return trip is just as deadly and terrifying, though, and Tennyson's use of repetition obviously makes that point. The poem now shifts though to emphasise also the loss of life. We get an image of horses and soldiers collapsing under the rain of gunfire. 
Notice also that this is the first time the speakers come out and called these men heroes, although that's clearly been the message from the beginning. Now Tennyson makes it explicit. While horse and hero fell. The alliteration there emphasising the idea. Now part of the Light Brigade returns back to safety, having fought so well. At the beginning of the poem we heard about how they were going into the jaws of death and now they're coming out again. By almost mirroring the first half of the poem in the second though, Tennyson is emphasising the key difference, which is of course that there are now many less men. So this mirroring effect emphasises the scale of the loss. All that was left of them, left of 600. The speaker doesn't tell us how many died, but we guess it's a large number. And the tone of the poem is much darker at this point. That's the final image we get of the battle itself. The remnants of the Light Brigade moving back across the field. A rhetorical question begins this closing stanza and it states the purpose of the poem. When can their glory fade? The answer is never. Their glory must obviously never fade. And that's why this poem's been written to immortalise it. And we're reading it today. So Tennyson was obviously successful in that aim. Oh, the wild charge they made. The O, oh, as well as the use of the exclamation mark, injecting real passion into that thought. And we're reminded of the desperation of the endeavour that we've just had described to us. And again, all the world wondered. That's repeated. And we're reminded that we ought to be in sheer awe and wonder at this feat of reckless heroism that we've just observed. And then Tennyson uses commands. He commands us to honour the charge they made. And he repeats it, honour the Light Brigade. So we don't need any inference skills at all to work out the purpose of this poem. We're being told it's to remember noble men, brave men, who died valiantly following orders. And in full knowledge of the risks, which were great. The Valley of Death is the first major visual image we get in this poem and it haunts the whole work. The valley is the setting for the poem and it's also personified so that death becomes a kind of character in this poem. It's not just the name of a valley anymore, it's a living thing ready to consume these brave soldiers. Tennyson also capitalises the word death, which is another way of emphasising its importance. Worth reflecting on the name as well. This isn't Company B or 10th Regiment, it's the Light Brigade. And we have all those positive associations, don't we, with the idea of light. Um, it's a force for good, for truth, and that's what these people are. However, we don't hear the name of individual people, do we? Of individual soldiers. It's a mass, it's a force of nature sweeping down the valley. And this poem is all about the unity of these men, their strength as a whole. That's a major theme. The more they seem like one being, the better, the stronger they are. Guns and cannon are a key image for the enemy in the poem, for the threat of death. It's a faceless enemy that the cavalry confront, a faceless threat from every side. Representing the Light Brigade, on the other hand, is the sabre, which connotes heroism and power. Soldiers on mounted horses are romantic images, aren't they, in the world of literature? Prince Charming, in the fairy tale, shows upon a horse. And the romance of the mounted warrior is certainly something that Tennyson is trying to evoke in this poem. The idea of knights, flashing sabres, which become a symbol for the heroism and power of the British army. So ultimately, Tennyson is celebrating war in this poem. He's highlighting the heroism and the awe-inspiring bravery of British soldiers in combat. And the theme of remembrance is there too, because he's commanding us never to forget them, 
but rather to honour, honour their unquestioning valour.